So we had our first beautiful day, sunny day, in what seems like weeks. It just rained and rained and rained. And someone scheduled an eclipse right in the middle of the beautiful day. So we got a chance to do some gardening this week, but uh, it got kind of cold and dark for a couple of hours. Anyway, at least the eclipse isn't going to happen for you know, another 80 years. Yeah, and interrupt our beautiful garden day. On this week's episode, we talk about bees. We talk about eating invasive plants, hydroponics, and what's going on in our grow room. I'm Alan. And I'm Sarah. And you're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. So aside from eclipses getting in the way, uh, it was mostly another week of uh, rain. And we even, I think, had a bunch of snow there for uh, a day or two. Yeah, April is a tough month because sort of anything can happen. You can have beautiful, beautiful summer days or you can be straight back to winter. So that's the Maritimes. That's what we're living with. But that snowfall, that like sort of late snowfall doesn't really hurt anything at this time of year, does it? No. And I mean, even for like driving around, there seems to be every time there's going to be a snowfall, everybody freaks out and, you know, cancels their restaurant reservations and says they're going to stay home all weekend. But I mean, it's slushy and not that bad out, really. We did get our winter tires off, so that's a sign of spring. That's true. And there's also lots more different animals and flowers and ephemerals showing up this time of year. I noticed goldfinches for the first time this week. Uh, So the small birds are starting to come back. So there must be something there for them to eat. Yeah, the Canada geese are back, the big birds as well. So they're chasing people on the path near our house, as usual. And they eat a lot of grass, it seems. So there's grass coming up, and the grass in our yard is turning green. So that's a surefire sign that uh, it's time to, uh, I guess, get the lawnmower out of the basement. Oh, God. Um, Otherwise, uh, we also see a bunch of insects coming about, uh, mostly some pollinators, Yeah, I mean, there's crocuses out in our garden quite a lot, and the bees on them the other day were incredible, and they were just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing away. Yeah, I just listened to this recording that Sarah took with her phone while videoing some bees on the crocuses. There are lots of bees on the crocuses, but they're all honeybees, and honeybees aren't actually native bees. They're European honeybees, correct? They are, yes, definitely. So it's interesting that on sort of like the European, like crocuses and early like snowdrops and stuff are not native plants, and the bees that are on them don't seem to be the native bees. So what are the native plants that are coming up first? And do the bees actually like? Yeah, good question. So the bees that are native bees that are coming out right now are a lot of the solitary bees and also the bumblebees. And I've just been learning about this. I think that in the last few years, people have been learning a lot more about native bees. It used to be sort of the idea that you just wanted to save the bees for the honeybees. But now there's a lot of uh, diversity of understanding about what kind of bees there are out there. So those guys, they emerge from the soil where they've been nesting all winter. And usually they're not in a hive. There's just like one of them. And it's usually a female and she's going to look for somewhere to to have her nest. Maybe she already has a nest in the soil and she's going to go back in it once she has some energy from foraging. Or maybe she's looking for a nest. So the bumblebee is hiding in the leaf litter. Yep and emerges now and needs to find something to eat and a nest. Yeah, exactly. And she's all on her own, but she's ready to lay eggs. She's already got eggs on the go from last year. Yes. So she's hibernated. She has eggs. She's ready to lay them. Where does she go to find something to eat? We were noticing the alder cakens are all big and fat. If you don't know what a caken is, it's like a pussy willow. It's like... A lot of um, deciduous trees produce, uh, I guess it's their flower. It's called a caken. It often looks like a caterpillar. Some trees have like great long ones and they kind of look like, yeah, worms or caterpillars. But those are actually, I guess, flowers. They're full of pollen and the bees eat the pollen. Now, I thought that bees ate nectar and then just transferred pollen around on their legs kind of as a secondary thing that benefited the flowers but they actually eat the pollen 
Yeah. So bees do eat nectar and they use nectar to make honey, which is like their primary food source that they use for energy. But then also pollen has a lot of different compounds in it, different like proteins, different minerals, all kinds of things that the plant is producing. Uh, and they're used by the bees mostly to feed their young. So that's what bees, honeybees will be feeding their, uh, the grubs, I guess, as they're hatching, they'll be feeding them bee bread, they call it, or pollen pollen granules, and then uh, native bees do this as well. So <clears throat> this time of year, then, the cakens are really an important thing. So yeah. uh, hardwood tree or shrub, and yeah. I noticed they're way up there, so you're not really looking up there for bees, but we have like some hazelnuts that are growing in the community garden, and they're like really full of cakens right now. And a lot of the other trees are. And this is actually, if you're an allergy sufferer, it seems like, why would my allergies be bothering me now? But cake and pollen is massive, like birch pollen, alder pollen. Those come out really early before the flowers, and they cause a lot of reactions in people. So. Yeah they can be a cause of your allergies. And it's interesting because I find like they are so understated looking like we're walking through a trail and there's a big alder bush. I mean, the alder bushes are everywhere and you hardly even notice because it doesn't look like a flower. It's not like a bright color that's really noticeable. It's not like spring blooms. It's more just like everything's kind of like fat and has some sort of like yellow tinge to it instead of just the brown and gray that you're used to. And you can see it in bigger trees as like the maple trees start to flower. It's just like, you know, the buds just swell a little bit. You can just sort of see a little bit of a hue of a, of a different shade all around. Yeah. And if you look like into like some trees or bushes in the distance in a sort of wildish area, you'll notice that uh, some of the trees they just are starting to turn red. Just the branches are turning mm -hmm. red. And like shrubs that do that would be like boxwoods yeah. will be red, turning darker red. And then uh, forsythia bushes look yellow yeah, before they, do. they bloom you out. You can see, oh my gosh, I've been cutting and forcing forsythia all like for the last couple months. Every few weeks I'll cut a couple branches and bring them inside because I love the blooms and it's so easy and fast to do. But they are like so obviously ready to go. Like and if you cut a branch right now, you could get it to bloom inside your house in like two days. And you can, you can force pussy willows. Yeah. And pussy, other pussy like, willows. Uh, and I think at this time of year, you could probably force, um, if you were trimming, say a cherry tree or an apple tree. Uh, it's best with the ones that come out with flowers before they come out with leaves. And I did take some cherry trimmings and I couldn't really get them to flower inside. I think maybe I wasn't vigilant enough about keeping the buds really wet and they dried out a bit. Uh, but probably now you could, the, the closer you are to like actual spring when bud break happens, the more success you'd have. And a great one actually is magnolia. I mean, who wants to cut a precious branch off a magnolia tree. They're so beautiful. But if you've got a big one around or, you know, we have a magnolia tree that's not large, but it has a few sort of branches that are uh, close to the ground that I could probably trim off. So Magnolia flowers are edible. I know. They taste like almonds. They taste like ginger as well. Almonds and ginger. Yeah. So we're going to definitely play around with that this year. Add it to the repertoire of all the beautiful flowers that, that we could use in the kitchen. So aside from the cakens on some of the trees, the other flower that is from around here that I noticed uh, that's out is the colt's foot. Right. The little yellow guys. So they look like dandelions, but they're not. They grow in the most marginal areas, usually in like the side of the road in the gravel. And they come out really early. And yeah, you'll find some local pollinators on those. Yeah. And other than that, it's a lot of green things happening, but not a lot of flowers yet. So speaking of green things, um, the garden is just getting to the point where the soil is thawed out. There's no major cold in the forecast, at least for the next two weeks. So is it time to start planting? I'm going to start a little bit. I mean, in our raised beds, they need to be topped up with a bit of soil uh, or a bit of compost. And the soil is back at the local home center and at the grocery store. Uh, so, and I imagine that the organics suppliers uh, piles have thought out enough that they can get 
a backhoe. Exactly. And now's a great time also to start poking around in your compost and see what it's done over the winter as well. I mean, it doesn't compost very quickly over the winter, but a lot of the time it's pretty surprising what happens in the sort of in-between seasons. So we fill our beds up and then we're going to start planting some stuff this week. I know that we got our Irish cobbler seed potatoes came in the mail this week. So we took those and we are going, we cut them in half. Um, not all of them, just the big ones. You want to make sure that you cut them in such a way that each piece uh, that you cut has eyes. Uh, you want to lay those on an egg carton and dry the cut sides out. It'll dry in about two days. Do it in a dry place that has good air circulation. And then depending on the kind of potato, seed potato you have, you can either plant that directly into the garden as soon as the soil is workable, or you can chit the potato. So chitting the potato is like, it happens naturally probably in your cupboard a lot where mm -hmm. the potato just starts to grow vigorous like shoots out of the eyes. And if you let that happen um, with your seed potatoes for a week or so and you get like four inch long, three, four inch long sprouts, then you would plant that with some potatoes. But with the Irish cobbler, uh, we want it to be in and uh, producing potatoes really early, hopefully in mid-June. So we're going to just plant those without chitting them. And also like chitting is good for maybe a later potato where they don't like the cold soil as much. Like I know you always chit uh, sweet potatoes, for example, if you're going to try and grow sweet potatoes in your garden, then they need to be chitted because uh, you want that long season. You want them in the ground as much as you can because they're generally grown to the south of us. Uh, but for the Irish cobblers, they're known as an early potato that's pretty cold hardy. So yeah, that's why we're going to put that right in the garden. And apparently you can plant Irish cobblers in the late fall. Hmm. I haven't tried that, but I've read that somewhere. Interesting. Maybe we'll try that in the future. And then we would have the earliest potato outside of growing in a greenhouse, which you could grow in like a unheated uh, greenhouse. Um, but it seems like for potatoes, that's... That's precious space. It seems like also if they froze super solid, they'd just turn to mush. But I don't know. Depends. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you've probably had experiences where you've left potatoes in your garden or your compost over oh, winter yeah. and found them sprouting the next year. That's a good point. Plants find a way. amazing things. Spe speaking of which, actually, when we were digging around in the garden, not digging around yet, but just walking around, uh, I noticed one area where there were these... Uh, looked like little nodes on the surface of the soil and I realized what they were were horseradish roots and what had happened is I, I grew horseradish a long time ago I planted it in our garden which is a mistake because it spreads like crazy yeah Sarah seems to have a little bit of a predilection for introducing invasive species well, into I... the garden uh, thinking that somehow they're going to <laughs> They're going to listen to her management techniques. <laughs> I think that I think that there's this inclination that I have when you're starting out a garden is like you want things that grow fast and you want them to be productive quickly. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll get some hops plants and some uh, some blackberries and some horseradish and no problem. I can keep these under control. Mint. Mint, another good one. But anyway, so the horseradish I've been digging up for years and I find it's not that bad as long as I know where it is. And every year a couple plants come up and then in the fall I dig them up and I use the horseradish roots and then I uh, compost the rest of it. And then there's a, a couple little pieces left in the soil somewhere that just grow up every year again. But anyway, this year I decided to dig it up as well as I could and I put it in one of those like um, fabric containers. Like a potato planting bag. Yeah, that they're pretty popular. You can find them again. They're great because you can store them over winter and they don't take up any space. But this one I just left full of dirt and the horseradish roots and I left it there for uh, the summer. And then I think in late fall, I picked up the bag and drug it away and dumped it in a bucket and pulled the horseradish roots out of it. But what I realized had happened is the roots had actually grown through the bag bottom without even really leaving holes. Like I think it must have just been like a tiny, tiny string of the root. And then they'd grown down into the soil. So you could just sort of see this little bump on the surface of the soil where I'd pulled the bag off. It was really strange. So the lesson would be that those fabric bags do are not good for containment of... Yeah invasive or just you know there's like like mint i guess it's invasive uh it's not um 
I mean, it's hard to control. You want to have it, but it likes to jump whatever container we put it in. Definitely. I didn't anticipate that they would do this. Just like grow straight down. Anyway, I I'm, I'm guess I'm not surprised, though. So the best, like, you know, the best thing is not to introduce these things into your garden. But if you do have some of these things um, and they are hard to control and or get rid of, but it's helpful if you learn to eat some of these things. So there's some things like mint and horseradish are pretty obvious. I don't know how much horseradish you want to eat, but like no. have an oyster party and like grate some no, and horseradish. You can like make like horseradish and beet dips I've made in the past. And mint you can dry like yeah. or make like just jam it in some vodka or something and make like different flavors out of it. Um, you can eat like not weed, although you wouldn't want to eat too much. And this is the time of year that it's probably best to eat it. It apparently makes a really good ice cream, but I've never had not weed ice cream. And you can eat gout weed. Yeah, you can. And you can also, you'd have to eat a lot of it. And I don't know how good it is. Creeping Charlie. Yeah. Different mustards, of course. Uh, what was the one? Wild. Oh, garlic mustard. Garlic mustard. That's an interesting one because that's not a garden plant or a one that you cultivate around. But I mean, garlic mustard has a delicious name. Uh, and it's a plant that's quite invasive. I don't know if it's like in the wilderness around here, but I know in Ontario and Quebec, it's become a real problem because it gets into the forests and it actually has an allopathic property to it. So that means that it actually inhibits the growth of other plants around it. So it will just take over the understory of a forest and all the native plants will be sort of like discouraged by that, that chemical property that it has. And it forms like a thick mat. Uh, what are some other allopathic plants just for interest sake? I think uh, black walnut trees. Oh yeah, definitely. They're sort of the famous one, black walnuts or beet or butternuts. They have the ju glands that are a, a compound that they produce. I think I saw where someone recommended planting allopathic plants to sort of try to um, fight off some of the more, uh, like something like a gout weed or something. Mm. There, lots of people try lots of different things. Yeah. But it's really hard to get rid of Japanese knotweed or gout weed. Yeah. You kind of have to learn to live with it or... You have to be, you have to accept the idea of spraying. Yeah, I mean, how do you get rid of knotweed? People have all kinds of different ways that they talk about doing it and goutweed as well. I spent quite a few years as a gardener and we would have entire jobs where we would just be digging through goutweed roots and trying to save those gardens. But like, that's not the kind of thing that's going to happen in like two or three sessions over a summer. Any of those, you're just going to spend years battling them. Like yeah, you just I, have to be persistent about them, whether you're cutting them down, you're digging them up, you're spraying them, you're covering them with tarps. And it, there's a lot of different information about what works for different ones. Like now they're saying, don't actually put tarps over knotweed. Instead, you have to like cut it. Anyway, it's all very complicated. And I, and I feel for you if you have a really bad invasive weed problem in your yard. It's the easiest way to get rid of goat weed? Is move. Yeah. That was the joke we always like to make. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you're full up uh, from eating um, the various invasive species, um, another one is uh, a little bit more containable, but we just had a major issue with is uh, jay chokes or sun chokes or Jerusalem artichokes, which are a relative of the sunflower. Yeah, they are. And they grow a tuber that's kind of like a potato. I guess it's a very weird, strange looking thing. Yeah. I find it sort of like a, a cross between like potato and like parsnip or carrot. Yeah. And it's a, uh, it's a culinary delight. Uh, it has a couple of issues with it. It has the nickname fartichoke yeah. because it creates gas in a lot of people. So uh, you don't really want to eat too much of it at one sitting to figure out uh, if you're the kind of person who uh, has that reaction to it. But we use it in the restaurant and it makes a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, J-choke puree, uh, which is really delicious. Yeah, we've done a few different things like purees are really great because it has a really beautiful texture. Uh, also just making like little fried chips. Uh, we did some fermented pickles as well that were just slices of it and that worked really well. I was reading that Potentially, the active fermentation actually inhibits some of its uh, farty, fartiness, I'll call it. 
Gassies, gassies. Term. Uh, so J chokes are awesome, but they really are because uh, they look like a sunflower. They grow really big. Uh, they take minimal amount of work, and they produce a food that you can harvest early in the spring when it's when it's best, uh, when there's not really anything else exciting in the garden to pull. But they can be really, really hard to control. Yeah. At the community garden, there's a whole front uh, area that's sort of like hilled up that's been planted with perennials and shrubs and trees, and it's super beautiful. And there's also so many Jerusalem artichokes in there. I don't know who planted them in there at one point, but they just, they spread all through it. So, you know, every year we go and we dig out as many as we can. And I've put down burlap and mulch over top to try and discourage them from growing. Uh, anything that has like a serious root mass, the idea is that you want to starve that root and make it basically rot and die in the ground. And the way that you're going to do that is by keeping it from photosynthesizing. So that might involve mowing or it might involve uh, mulching or pulling it up whenever you see it. But basically, if you can keep the plant from cr like creating any green material that uh, gets energy from the sun and sends that back down into the root, you can eventually kill the root. But that can take like decades in the form of knotweed. So, you know, I'm hoping J chokes aren't that invasive. And I think I've read like three to four years, you can kill them off if you keep them from, from growing up top. So fingers crossed. Yeah, well, they're delicious anyway. And I'm going to try eating some of these uh, more invasive ones uh, more often because if there's anything, if there's any way to decimate a population, it's for humans to start that's eating true. it. That's true. That's a good point. If humans get into it, then that's it. Yeah. We're not very good at showing restraint. Uh, so on some other notes, indoors, uh, we had another go at our little hydroponic setup. Uh, so we basically took a couple of Rubbermaids and cut some holes, put, and you take these little baskets, you fill them with a growing medium, but basically the plants are just living off of the aerated water. So you have like one of those little um, aquarium air pumps that just pumps like water through a, or air through a stone and it bubbles up. And then into this, you put some fertilizer. So we tried just using some fertilizer we had around and we had mixed results with that. Yeah, the lettuce actually did fine. But then I also had some tatsoi growing and some kale growing, and it did not do fine. The tatsoi, especially the leaves, turned yellow. So they totally became like a different color. And the kale kind of just withered up and didn't, didn't do anything. So we ordered uh, off the uh, great uh, and bountiful internet some specific uh, fertilizer, like a two bottle. So I think you put one bottle in at the start and then you add the other one later. Did you forget? No, you put both bottles in. You just like measure out of it from each. I don't know why it's always two parts. I could uh, Maybe if you mix out. them together, they would I think so, react yeah. with one another. Exactly. Anyway, so we put this in and it didn't take very long and things are looking way better. Yeah, I did that like four days ago and the lettuce is way bigger even than it was. Uh, it's like full size head lettuce now and the tatsoi uh, has new leaves and they're all dark green. And I threw out the kale and I threw some chard and some uh, basil in there and then they're doing pretty well as also. So, you know, you can grow your own, you know, hydroponics pretty simply, but as far as being a kind of solution to a problem, because it's like, Vertical farming is like this crazy thing and like everyone was really into it. And then the vertical farming scene has kind of crashed over the last winter and a half or something like that because it takes a lot of energy inputs. And mm -hmm. like if something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. You also only grow a few different things. So it's a, it's challenging, but it's interesting to try. But I mean, to scale it up to the point where it had the equivalent sort of production as even a unheated winter greenhouse that had spinach in it, like you would need yeah. a lot of these little water tanks. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, and it's, you know, they take up a fair bit of space and they take up light space. And I, it's fun right now because I've got a lot of transplants growing for the garden. So I can just sort of sub those in and try different ones out. Like I'm going to pull out this 
the lettuce that's almost full size and put in some smaller lettuce transplants and see how fast they grow. So, so I sort of have plant material around to do this with. And I think over the winter, they could be great. You know, we'll figure out, be a good way to grow fresh basil. I find uh, basil in pots tends to get aphids and uh, yeah, things like basil, doesn't necessarily cilantro, do all that well. Yeah, parsley. I think they would be, they would be nice, but I mean, we're not going to really bother over the summer when things start to grow. And in the winter, like honestly, like there are really good hothouse tomatoes and cucumbers grown in Canada, both locally in the Maritimes, but especially coming from like Leamington, Ontario, where like you should Google map Leamington, Ontario and see like how much acreage is under glass there. Yeah. It is incredible. It's amazing. And actually I have some tomatoes that I planted in January because I just really wanted to plant some seeds and got excited and they were mini dwarf tomatoes. So they're ones that have very small, uh, internodes. So between the leaves, they, they just will grow only to like about a foot tall. And one of them's actually about to make a tomato has a tiny little mini tomato. So that's a tomato off of a plant that you grew inside yeah, over winter. Totally. The other thing I noticed uh, on the windowsill in the building is a calendula that flowered. Oh yeah, I planted those also in January, and then with they... the idea that, that we would have like edible flowers to put on the plates in the restaurant. Exactly. And we have them at around the same time as we could probably get them from well, outside. Well, no, <laughs> calendula is going to be a little while, and actually the calendula. They were a bit of a failed experiment where they got aphids pretty badly. So I relegated them to the laundry room window where they wouldn't be around any other plants, but they're flowering anyway. So there you go. It's a south facing window, so it gets quite a bit of sunlight. But in any window, even if it's south facing, like you're missing all of that, like eastern sun and yeah. western sun and just sort of getting the southern sun. Uh, so you're just getting a third maybe of the available sunlight. Yeah, but this is the time of year also where like I have too many plants under the amount of lights that I have. So I'm going to start moving things around under windows. So any plants that are getting big enough that they can handle it, they aren't going to get too stretched and leggy the way the tomatoes do. A lot of them, they don't need full sun. You know, once you get them past the seedling stage where they're like got three or four new leaves on them, they're going to be okay. And modern LED lights, the the ones that, you know, are at the home center now, those are generally like you can get the full daylight, full spectrum ones. You don't have to buy special grow lights. You don't have to spend extra money on that. You can just put one of those bulbs into a lighting fixture and put it over your plants. Right. Especially if your plant's in a window, then like that's lots of light. Yeah. And just turn it on and off or you can buy one of these uh, timers now that you can get that are... Uh, Wi-Fi timers, you can control them with your phone and set up programming. So it's easier than ever to subsidize the lighting that your plants get. And, you know, the more lighting, the better, I guess, to a, a certain point. But I usually say like 18 hours is my go-to. Yeah. And I don't know how long the daylight is here in like, you know, June 21st, maximum daylight. I'm not sure how many hours it is, but it's definitely over 12 by a long shot. And on that note, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. We're on CHMA 106.9 FM, CKDU 88.1. And you can find us on YouTube at Culinary Garden. And on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. As Culinary Garden. Toodly-doo.